Uh, Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto Katoa, Kiora. Uh, thank you very much indeed for asking me along. Um, I'm sorry we're a little late before lunch. Uh, normally I get the low rumble of snoring after lunch, uh, so it'll be unusual to have the low rumble of the empty puku uh, just uh, working up to the lunch interval. Um, it's an honour to be here, actually. I don't often get the chance to talk to so many people involved on the front line of respiratory uh, medicine in New Zealand. Um, those of us who, who work in the ivory towers, I guess, we're quite insulated from uh, the real world. And as we heard yesterday, insulation for our patients is very good, but not necessarily for our uh, physicians, uh, who don't see with the things that you do. Um, I've been asked to talk about IPF. Uh, my name is Ben Brockway. For those who don't know me, I'm from down in Dunedin. Uh, Chris Lamsam, it's uh, useful that you know that Dunedin is a small town just south of Outram. Uh, <laughs> so they sold you a dud yesterday, didn't they? <laughs> So uh, there's a couple of things I'd like to do today. I've got no uh, disclosures. Oh, well, eh? Mm. Bong. Oh. Right. Uh, and so what we're going to do is a brief primer about idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. It's a complex set of illnesses, um, and, and there's that question about what am I needing to be suspicious about to trigger that thought, could this be IPF? How we investigate it, what treatments are available and who they're suitable for, and what support and education is needed, and that's a big area. And it's complex. And no one uh, is going to be able to say that it's anything other than complex. IPF is a tough disease to uh, nail the diagnosis for. And this is one of those slides you put up and you just think, oh, man, I've just lost almost the entire audience. Um, so IPF is in there. IPF is somewhere in here. Oh, it's not quite working, is it? Um, oh, there we go. Slow but, uh, slow but steady. Uh, so IPF is down uh, on the left uh, towards the bottom there. Um, but there's all sorts of other triple letter acronyms, uh, CPFE, AIP, DIP, NSIP, LIP, COP, RBUILD. And by the time you get to idiopathic pleuroparenchymal fibroelastosis, there's only one rational response, uh, which is just to go, oh man, this is impossible. Um, <laughs> so you don't necessarily have to worry too much about the subtleties of the differentiations of the 240 odd different types of interstitial lung disease that are out there um, at the moment. We'll just put that to one side. This worked absolutely perfectly, didn't it, earlier? And of course, not now. Um, we've missed one. Let's go back. Okay, so what is IPF? IPF is a incurable progressive form of interstitial lung disease. And there's about 200 different causes for ILD, some of which are pretty rare in New Zealand. Um, I've yet to see my first case of uh, Finnish sauna workers lung, uh, but I live in hope. Um, IPF is the, the most common version of the ILDs, probably about 45% of ILD is IPF. And that means probably between 2 to 7 per 10,000 people, which sounds pretty rare, but then you think, well, that's 2,000 plus people in New Zealand, so uh, framed like that, it's more common than you might think. I'm not aware of any Maori-specific data. Um, IPF appears to be an equal opportunities killer, unfortunately. Uh, but the caveats about access to healthcare and navigating healthcare still apply. Um, it tends to be a disease of slightly older patients, uh, age 50 to 70 is usual age of onset. Uh, males are more commonly affected uh, than females, and most of the patients will have smoked in the past, but it's in the nature of idiopathic, the definition being that we do not know what caused this illness. Um, it's not a disease directly related to smoking. Now, the bad news is average life expectancy after diagnosis is about two and a half years before death by respiratory failure. And that's a tough one to get over to your patients. And I always say to them, my mum is five foot tall and my dad is six foot tall. So on average, they're both five foot six. But that tells you absolutely nothing about either of them because neither of them are five foot six. And it's the same when you talk about averages for life expectancy. 
There's a group in there who unfortunately do really badly and die quite quickly, often within a year. There's also a group of long-term survivors who might last out for 10, 12, 15 years. And it's very hard to know when you first see your patient which group they're going to be in. Um, rather like COPD, you get exacerbations, and those exacerbations can be infective or non-infective. And we always heave a bit of a sigh of relief if they're infective because we can treat them and try and get them better. Non-infective exacerbations of IPF are really very dangerous to our patients. You've got about a 50% chance of getting out of hospital alive with a non-infective exacerbation. So they're considerably worse in terms of outcome than and COPD exacerbations. And in terms of what makes you suspicious about IPF, if you're doing a, a nurse-led clinic or something and, and you're thinking, could this be IPF? What, what are the things that make you uh, get your radar pinging? Um, it's usually the degree of breathlessness and often hypoxemia compared to what the spirometry looks like. Um, and actually uh, examining the patients um, and those, those crackles. And as uh, Conroy put this slide up yesterday, um, we have uh, Lenek to thank for the invention of the stethoscope. Before the stethoscope was invented, you had to press your ear to the chest of the patient. And as I said to the Health and Disability Commissioner the other day, that's probably not that appropriate these days. Um, <laughs> And so the neck invented the big uh, wooden tube there. Um, it's a great pity that no one dresses like that anymore. I want all my patients to wear pantaloons. That would be magnificent. <laughs> but we do have near patient screening for IPF in terms of stethoscopes. They're cheap. They're reliable. You can take them to the patient. And they're actually quite useful for finding IPF patients. Um, it's one of the rare occasions, I have to say now, that I really do listen really very carefully indeed, looking for crackles, listening for crackles. Right, it's good. This it's about a five second delay before I press it, and something happens, which is disappointing. So, in terms of IPF, what you find um, breathlessness and dry cough are very common features, and patients may have digital clubbing. Um, about 40 45 percent of patients have digital clubbing, uh, very characteristic appearance of the, of the fingernails. Uh, also occurs in lung cancer and bronchiectasis. And if this has been a relatively new occurrence for your patient rather than being born like that, then I'd certainly be very keen to get an x-ray and have a good look at them. Spirometry is often surprisingly normal or restrictive. These patients rarely have obstruction. Uh, you can get the combination of IPF and some emphysema. They have a relatively normal looking pattern or mild obstruction. So these are patients who are profoundly breathless and have really quite boring spirometry. And that's uh, something to, to just flag up in your mind. And I always say to my patients, this is a progressive scarring of your lung tissue. And think of it like a, a bath sponge. Normally, a wet bath sponge moves up and down quite happily. That's just like the lungs. There's fluid components, like the blood, within the lungs, and there's air components, and they bounce up and down as you breathe perfectly well. With IPF, what happens is, is instead of a nice wet bath sponge, you've effectively got a, a dried-out old loofah, which has got stiffer and harder, and it's much harder to get the oxygen in, harder to move the lungs. Very difficult to get the air in contact with the, uh, with the blood as well. So these patients are breathless for more than one reason. And when you actually listen to them with your stethoscope, it'll sound a bit like this, hopefully. So this is three inhalations from a patient with ILD. That noise is likened to Velcro ripping open. So it's quite a vivid uh, way of thinking about these patients really struggling to get that breath in. So spirometry is useful, as I've said, mostly in terms of excluding airflow obstruction. It's cheap, easy, should be able to get it fairly easily. Hands up if you can get spirometry within about a week of wanting it. Oh, that's a bit disappointing, isn't it? Um, spirometry is useful for looking at FVC rather than FEV1. FVC is quite a good marker of disease trajectory. The patients who lose over the first six months just a little, you know, a percent or two of their FVC tend to keep on trucking along like that in the long run. The patients who drop like a stone early on on their FVC generally continue to keep dropping dramatically. So it's quite a useful test for prognosticating. You need an HRCT. Um, I don't know what it's like where you are, but most breathless patients who come to ED where I am get a CTPA to look for primary emboli. That's not really what's required. But the good news is for most scanners and scanning um, 
uh, software these days actually take the HRCT as well. And they keep that data for a few days. And if you phone them up and say, can you do me some high-res recons on the study you did yesterday, please? They can actually try and get the high-res slices that you need for diagnosing ILD. And as I alluded to earlier, there's an awful lot of ILD possibilities. And getting the exact subtype right and nailing the diagnosis of IPF is quite difficult. And you need, rather than a, a therapeutic multidisciplinary team, you need a, a diagnostic multidisciplinary team. And that may involve radiologists and physicians and nurse specialists and rheumatologists and pathologists. Um, it's rarely the case that you need a, a pathologist in a, in a therapeutic MDT. Um, because ILD is relatively rare, you need to concentrate the patients going through small numbers of centres uh, to get the diagnosis right. Um, and I'll mention a bit more about that because the... Uh, certainly the data from Europe and North America suggests that after 20 years of doing regular ILD MDMs, you start to become expert, which is quite depressing, I would say, having done this for about five or ten years. Um, I'm nowhere near expert, and I'm somebody who has an interest in this sort of thing, and I'm well aware that I really don't know that much about it. And so certainly in New Zealand, I think there's a strong case of saying, well, we need a, an Auckland centre uh, and we probably need a Christchurch centre, and we may need one other, but actually this isn't the kind of thing that you should do in a small peripheral hospital like Dunedin, uh, because you really do need vast numbers coming through to keep your skills up. Uh, and if you don't have all that experience over time, the, the diagnostic accuracy of the MDM drops quite sharply. Um, sometimes you need surgical biopsies, you might need cryobiopsies, they're all things, again, that should be done in big centres. I would never dream of doing a cryobiopsy in Dunedin. I just would never do enough to make myself skilled at doing it. And sometimes, uh, rather than being quite difficult, it's actually very easy. So appreciating that you don't tend to see too many HRCTs in the normal scheme of things, there's a fairly normal set looking set of lungs. And if we morph into an ILD set of lungs, you can clearly see dramatic change in the lung parenchyma and that honeycombing around the edge of the lung that you can see quite nicely. And you get traction bronchiectasis, not bronchiectasis in the way that Conroy talked about yesterday with all the pus and the sputum and horribleness. Um, what's happening in, in IPF with traction bronchiectasis is you've got normal lung here, normal lung here and a bronchus running down in between. And as the normal lung contracts and, and shrivels, then the bronchus widens. So it looks like bronchiectasis, but it doesn't behave like bronchiectasis, as we talked about yesterday. And there's a whole heap of criteria. And those honeycombs, you can hear them as they open and, uh, and click and crack. It's just a horrible noise. Um, there's a whole heap of criteria for diagnosing what we call UIP pattern, which is what we see on a HRCT that diagnoses IPF. So it tends to be around the bases of the lungs, right up against the edge of the pleura. You get this sort of reticulation. It's a net-like change or sort of fishnet stocking kind of change in the lung parenchyma. And honeycomb, maybe with traction bronchiectasis. And if you've got all those things and nothing else, you can be very confident, about 95% confident, that this is IPF and you don't need to get a biopsy. But if you've got other things that don't make sense, you've got ground glass or nodules or effusions or things that just are weird for IPF, then you may well have to get surgical biopsies, and they have a certain degree of uh, danger to them. And you get all sorts of weird stuff coming through, uh, and that's where the ILD MDM needs all that experience to be able to differentiate what these different patterns of disease are. So we'll move on to treatments. Um, can be divided basically into three, the antifibrotic medical therapies, lung transplantation, and, and the whole palliative uh, support of patients and their families. So we do now have uh, happily perfenidone available. It was subsidized as of this year. Um, Nintednib is somewhat available on, uh, on a compassionate basis from the manufacturers for some patients, but it's not readily available. And these drugs slow down progression and they reduce the exacerbations at the expense of significant side effects in a number of patients. There are new drugs coming through, like pamrevlimab. Um, I'm involved in one of the pamrevlimab studies, and I'm quite excited about pamrevlimab. Um, I don't want to break any uh, non-disclosure agreements, but I've seen things with pamrevlimab that I've never seen before with any other treatment for IPF in a good way. Um, 
I've seen some other things uh, in other drugs that really weren't so good. Um, lung transplant, I have to say, is still an excellent treatment choice for the patients in whom that's an appropriate treatment choice. Um, if you select your patients right, you can get fabulous uh, uh, improvements in their life and longevity. But it is increasingly difficult with age. As patients get older and they have more comorbid conditions, ischemic heart disease, diabetes, that sort of thing, it gets much harder to get people through transplantation. And even if there's not a, a fixed age cutoff, there's often a perception that well, you're over 60, it's going to be difficult. And that has moved up to, well, you're over 65, it's going to be difficult. And hopefully in a few years' time we'll be saying, well, look, it's, you're over 70, that's going to be difficult. That perception of age being a barrier can lead to people not being referred inappropriately. And palliative care is often something that you need to bring in quite early. Patients have quite distressing symptoms reasonably early on, especially cough and breathlessness. Um, and so it's one of those cases, as with many respiratory diseases, where palliation actually starts at the point of diagnosis, a bit like COBD. You're going to start palliating breathlessness with inhalers and pulmonary rehab. And you don't necessarily affect the natural history of the disease, but you do improve the symptoms. Now, in terms of cough and breathlessness, sometimes that's difficult. That may require opiates. Um, high flow supplemental oxygen is something that's easy to do in hospital and much harder to do out of hospital. And there's a lot of work needs to be done at looking after these patients uh, psychologically and their far now as well. And as we've heard already, pulmonary rehab is effective in improving quality of life in terms of breathlessness and exercise capacity and is safe in interstitial lung disease, provided that you have oxygen to exercise these patients on. I'm reminded of this very wise man's uh, suggestion. So Cyril Chantner said, uh, medicine used to be simple, ineffective and s relatively safe. It's now complex, effective, and potentially dangerous. And I think that's very true uh, in ILD as much as anywhere else. If we get uh, the wrong treatments, we make people worse. And if you went to a, a talk like this five or ten years ago, we could have told you really well the things that made your patients even worse than they were before. So uh, the history of IPF uh, treatments is littered with disasters. Um, we know that steroids kill our patients with IPF faster and they have a more miserable time while they're dying on steroids. So there really is very little role for steroids in the management of IPF. That's in contrast to other forms of ILD where steroids may well be the mainstay of treatment. We know things like Bacenta and azathioprine and cyclophosphamide don't work. And I went to a talk a couple of years ago in Denver where Marvin Schwartz stood up and gave the funniest talk I've ever heard on ILD. Man, we didn't know what we were doing. Nothing worked. We didn't think we could make it any worse. But we were wrong about that one. We made it so much worse. So he was very honest, shockingly honest, about the, the, the problems we've had in the past. But we can move on now. We've got some positive studies in IPF. And these are very small images. And I may or may not be able to get my pointer up. Yes, I can. Um, in any RCT, you're looking at divergence between the, uh, the treatment group and the non-treatment group. And the further apart those lines move, the bigger the treatment effect. And so we've got various studies here um, looking at six-minute walk test changes or uh, possibility of dying or having an exacerbation. And these are all good drugs that make a difference. But you'll notice they don't reverse things. They just slow the rate of progression. And the drugs, uh, while they are good, they also come with side effects. And those side effects are things, I mean, in the same way as the best way of stopping it raining is always to from Dunedin, I know about these things. It's take an umbrella, isn't it? The best way to stop it raining is to take your umbrella with you and then you know it's never going to rain. And, and it's the same for the um, management of the side effects of IPF. Um, you warn people, you, you talk to them about these are potential side effects, this is how we manage them, let's walk you through this quite carefully. And although in uh, the studies you may get out to 30%, 36% of people getting nausea, for instance, the numbers who actually have to discontinue treatment, one, one and a half percent. So you can actually manage the, the side effects quite well. In summary, most of it's gut-related. Um, toilet roll's your friend. Uh, Nintendib in uh, the UK is actually packaged with Imodium in the same packet. You get your loperamide to control the diarrhea in the same packet that your Nintendib comes in. Uh, and you need to keep out the sun uh, because you get quite marked photosensitivity uh, and have to wear a big, broad-brimmed, floppy hat. Baseball caps don't do it and slap on the factor 25 at least. Even on quite a cloudy day, the, the UV still gets through the clouds. 
In terms of support, um, the picture's changing quite rapidly. Um, Robin Pitcher was a patient of mine back in 2011 when we had no real treatments available for IPF and he wasn't a transplant candidate. And uh, Elsa was his formidable wife uh, who um, was really a, a force of nature in herself. And although uh, there were many things about his care that went very well, we stuffed up completely on the discharging uh, from hospital and getting the home cares in and things like that. And uh, Elsa being Elsa was so <laughs> enraged by this uh, and the lack of support available for IPF uh, the, she actually set up the IPF support group in New Zealand at that stage. And has, it's really been a one-woman show, and she is a formidable woman, uh, and she's been magnificent to work with. Um, and as time gets by and the grandchildren are, are, are growing up, she's realised that uh, she needs to spend a bit more time with them. And, uh, and I'm excited to say, and I think I'm allowed to say, uh, that the uh, uh, Asthma Respiratory Foundation is going to take over that function for support uh, for patients and education uh, with Elsa's help. So that will be coming through, uh, hopefully in the next year. I'm excited to be involved in that, and thank you very much for asking me. Um, if you look at the, uh, the global uh, perspective, this was a paper in the ERJ last year, looking at what's important for patients and their families, and there's really nothing that's that surprising there. They want to get the diagnosis early and accurately, and want to be on to treatment as soon as they can, and that treatment may be medical or it may be transplantation. Um, irrespective of age, they're very clear on that. That's for the transplant guys to work out how they can get older patients with more conditions safely through transplantation. They're very keen on a holistic approach to IPF management, and that's absolutely vital. Comprehensive and high-quality information about IPF, and better access to palliative care and managing end-of-life care. Uh, and that can be quite challenging in these patients. So there is significant unmet need. Um, we've talked through clinical presentation uh, and the discordant clinical picture from the spirometry and the degree of breathlessness and maybe the amount of hypoxemia they have. Getting to the tests you need, whether that's spirometry, uh, HRCT. And the one thing that's different from other forms of uh, respiratory disease is the need for that spe uh, uh, very specialist multidisciplinary diagnostic MDM. Um, Therapies, we need availability of therapies. Uh, Profenadone, it's great that we've got it. We also need to have an intedinib available for the patients who can't take profenadone. Uh, chronic disease management, uh, we uh, have heard a lot about today. We really need to get palliative care involved early with these patients. We need to look very carefully at advanced care planning. There's a lot of questions about how we manage oxygen in the community. It's quite easy to give 15 litres of oxygen in a hospital. It's very difficult indeed to give 15 litres of oxygen in the community, in patients' homes, when your concentrator goes up to four, four and a half litres. And you can't really stack up three concentrators in time together and hope you can get 12 out in any meaningful manner. I don't know about the role of high-flow uh, uh, um, ventilation, airvo type devices in this setting, but I suspect as you're... Uh, vital capacity falls in your dead space, the, the non-ventilating bit of your lung uh, uh, reaches your vital capacity, it may be that reducing your dead space becomes more effective. And anecdotally, I think some of my patients with IPF feel a lot happier on an AIRVO device, and some of them feel a lot worse, and it's hard to pick who's going to do what. So there's a number of pitfalls available. Um, we're all aware of the cancer spotlight paradox. It's great that we can get patients through to their scans for cancer generally within two weeks. That's magnificent. It also means, certainly in Dunedin, our scanner is tied up doing emergency work and cancer work. And so my routine HRCT wait time is now six months, which is just completely inappropriate for these patients who really need to know what's going on and need to get on to the right treatments at the right time. We need to sort out how we're going to manage the infrastructure for ILD MDMs in Aotearoa. It's, uh, something that's, I think, unique to this particular condition. But nothing else here is unique because when we're talking about access to spirometry, and access to specialist care, access to tests, access to primary rehabilitation, uh, access to palliative care, that's all things that are pretty much generic for most of our respiratory conditions, isn't it? We know that if we get the diagnosis wrong or we delay, we actually do our patients harm. And if we give them steroids when we shouldn't do, we're clearly doing them harm as well. There's a whole scope for the emotional support for these patients. Um, 
I get, I think, one hour of clinical psychology support per week, which is nowhere near enough to even scrape the surface of the burden of respiratory disease. We need IPF-specific uh, patient information for patients in whānau. Um, and the pulmonary rehab question is, is, is really important because these patients really feel... Uh, a benefit from pulmonary rehab. They're, yep, they're breathless. They're really breathless sometimes. They need extra oxygen. But actually, in terms of meeting other people socially and mentally, it's incredibly valuable to them. Uh, and, and we need to work out how we're going to manage those challenges of remote patients requiring rehab. And the formal multidisciplinary care uh, in terms of therapy remains pretty fragmented, unfortunately. So I'm imagining uh, a, a utopia where the diagnostic pathways are sorted out. We can get spirometry quickly, and we can get our diagnostic imaging quickly, and we've got that ILD MDM established across the entire of New Zealand. We've got access to antifibrotic therapies, whatever they may be, um, and particularly in the future, I'm really looking forward to pamrevlimab being available. Um, we've got a whole supportive package, including education, pulmonary rehabilitation support for patients in Farnau and integration of the palliative care team within that. So I think uh, I've finished five minutes early because I'm aware the rumbling of stomachs is going to uh, mean that we're going to be trampled. Get away from the doors, you're going to get trampled <laughs> uh, on the way out. I hope we've touched on what IPF is and how to define it amongst that group of complex illnesses, what we do with investigations, what treatments are available, and where the uh, unmet need is for this condition. So. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, ben thought he was going to release us for lunch, but no, we're going to have a little question and answer, so I'm sure that there will be people in this room who are interested in learning a little bit more about IPF. I'm now educated. I feel great about knowing about this thing. But Ben, one of the questions that I had um, that was just mulling around in my head, you Obviously, today we've been talking about wraparound support, and you sort of mentioned that um, the support of whānau and family is really important for patients with this condition, this disease. So um, what are some of the most practical things that you know that whānau or the people around these people can really do to help make their, um, their journey um, more, uh, sorry, less burdened? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. When you say to people that you've got pulmonary fibrosis and, and they say, well, at least it's not cancer, and you say, well, actually, you could pick pretty much any common cancer apart from maybe lung and pancreas, and your outlook is considerably better with breast or colorectal cancer than it is with IPF. And, and people don't know that because people don't know about IPF um, in, the, in the general population. Um, so education about actually how miserable disease this can be is important. People don't kind of realise how breathless these patients are and how difficult it is to get on top of it. Um, it's mostly about the support for getting through that breathlessness. These patients live with breathlessness from a fairly early state, um, perhaps more so than a good number of our patients with COPD who may only be uh, variably breathless in the early stages of their disease. Um, Pulmonary rehabilitation, again, what can people do at home to keep themselves active within the limits of their disease, uh, which hopefully pulmonary rehab empowers people to do, although we are still a bit short on evidence about that. I think those are the key things. Thank you for that. Any questions from the floor today? Anyone? James. Dr. James. Thank you. Um, I'm curious, with people, uh, as you say, people with IPF tend to, is associated with quite a poor prognosis and relatively rapid progression. But we do see people who seem to have a, a relatively indolent course who are a bit milder, but then later on um, seem to develop more of the classic trajectory. And I've heard mixed views about whether or not those people should have access to things like perfenidone. Uh, and I'm curious what your approach is when somebody's had a very unusual initial time course but then starts to progress. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and we're slightly hampered by the special authority criteria for the availability of perfenidone in New Zealand because uh, if your lungs are only a little bit bad, you can't get it. 
which means you have to wait until they've started to get really bad before you can give it. And, and that doesn't make much sense to me, to wait for patients to get sicker before you treat them. And that that's, reflects the available evidence at the time that the submissions went in. I think we probably know now a bit better that there is a role for antifibrotic medications before your FVC has fallen below 80%. So I try very hard... Uh, I can't say some of these things on record, can I? I try very hard to make sure that the spirometry is not particularly dramatically good. Uh, <coughs> you can edit that bit out. There's no one here from Pharmac, is there? No. Uh, <laughs> should, we, should we try one last question? Should we try? Just a question around oxygen and oxygen therapy for these people, because traditionally we use arterial blood gases, as you know, and it's often quite a long time before they meet that resting arterial blood gas criteria. Mm. And we do a bit of the same. We say, well, let's have you bend down and pick up something off the floor, and then we'll take the blood gas. Um, is there any trials being done around oxygen and IPS specifically? Because they don't get it until it's often very late. Yeah, I don't know about the early stage. I don't know if anyone else in the room knows. I'm not aware of anything. Um, it's interesting, isn't it, how you can always rely on health professionals to try and just gently flex the rules a little bit to try and do what they think is the best things for their patients. Um, it makes sense, doesn't it? But I guess you're balancing the... Uh, the difficulties of oxygen therapy and the, the risks of tripping over the uh, nasal specs and breaking your hip and all those other issues about tying people down to oxygen that, that cramps their style somewhat uh, as well. So uh, it, it's a difficult uh, decision to make sometimes. Yeah. Well, thank you, Dr. Ben. Uh, we have reached the end of our time for question and discussion, but can we give, give Dr. Ben a round of applause? Thank you. Thank you.